So um, hello, uh, welcome for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. And um, so I'm going to talk about uh, flow states today. And let me start by introducing myself a little bit. So uh, my name is uh, Dimitri van der Linde. Um, actually, I'm a, I have a background in cognitive psychology. So I studied cognitive psychology in Utrecht at the time. Then I made a switch from cognitive psychology to work in organizational psychology. Um, there I studied fatigue and other brain states. And after that, I went to uh, the Radboud University as an assistant professor. And then from uh, about 2010, I went to uh, Rotterdam to become a professor. I, I'm engaged in all kinds of research. I do research on individual differences, personality, intelligence, but also different states of the brain, like stress, fatigue, and since a couple of years also uh, flow and engagement. So uh, today I'm going to talk about this specific topic. I'm going to talk a bit about what is flow. So what are the main characteristics of flow? Uh, and then we're going to switch to, can we see flow in the brain? And then at the end, I have some reflections on flow and creative activities. So uh, let's start with uh, the question, what is flow? Well, the most general uh, definition I would say is it, it's a state of full task absorption. And uh, it means you're kind of really focused on the task. You really put all your energy, all your effort, your attention into the task. And this is accompanied with low levels of what they call task irrelevant thoughts. Things like worrying, uh, rumination, anxiety, but even also if you think about positive implications of success, even that is task irrelevant thoughts. And this kind of thinking is quite low when you are in a state of flow. Uh, often uh, people in a flow perform quite well. They do, they are actually at their personal best. So uh, of course you will not be a 3000 uh, score chess player. But uh, within your skills, when you're in a flow, most of the time you, you kind of perform quite well. And similar, related to uh, the, the topic about thinking, is that you also have a neglect of the environment. So when you focus, it's obvious you kind of tend to forget the things that happen around you. And, uh, and also a very important characteristic is that time seems to fly. So if you're working for an hour, for example, it might, may, it might take, it might seem like half an hour, 10 minutes, it's, time flies by. Michael Chikisek Mihail, it's a very difficult name. He was one of the, the, the person that coined the, the, the label flow. And in the beginning, he mainly studied it by looking at dancers, artists, um, painters. And um, well, he, he noticed that people could work on, on tasks for many, many hours without getting fatigued, without getting bored. And he said, well, this is a very nice phenomenon that I want to study. Um, I think most people have some sense of what flow means. Uh, sometimes they call it being in the zone. Yeah. So for example, if you think about a, a teenage uh, boy, they typically tend to spend many, many hours of in gaming and, and um, they, they kind of seems to forget, seem to forget everything. So this is uh, also a manifestation of this state, this flow. This is related to arts, but sports, but of course it can also occur in, in everyday life. So it, it can occur during work, during maybe even during household uh, course. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's a very, it can occur in every uh, specific activity. So you can refer to flow as a state. So at this moment I can be in a flow or I cannot be in a flow, but sometimes people also refer to flow like over a whole period. Here I have an example of a screenwriter. Uh, I found it on the internet and she uh, talked about, uh, well, how she started and then she actually also mentioned uh, the term flow. She says, we were both unemployed. Uh, then we started with an obsessive flow state for several weeks, sitting in the hotel. And then she uh, wrote a, a screenplay. I don't know if you know her. She's uh, Susanna Vogel. She's the, the writer of uh, Spy Who Dumped Me, writer and director. So it's, uh, yeah. Now probably, hopefully, you have a sense of what flow is. We can look at the more formal definitions or characteristics of flow. Uh, if you look at the literature, so uh, we already mentioned that there's a very strong task focus. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the core aspects of flow, of course. Uh, we also talked a little bit about reduced self-reflection. Self-reflection means worrying, rumination, um, and of course you also forget your environment. 
um, a feeling of being in control. And also, most of the time, you have clear goals. So you know what you want to achieve. You know where you're going to. And related to that is that during the task, most of the time, you also get some feedback. The feedback com can come from the task itself, noticing that you're doing okay. Uh, it can come from other people around you, maybe from your own body, if you're a dancer or something. But um, there's some feedback on how you're doing. Another characteristic of flow is that people that are in flow often have a relentless drive. So there's a lot of energy. Yeah, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, this Michael Csikszentmihalyi, uh, he uh, studied his painters and he noticed that they could go on for hours and hours. And that's what really kind of uh, struck him. So this relentless drive is one of, the, of course, the nice things of flow. Um, it often occurs in association with intrinsic motivation. So you feel that you really do something that you really want to, eh? you're really motivated. And um, I think we also uh, heard that with uh, re regard to the talk on creativity, that it also is rewarding. So it means that uh, the state itself feels quite nice. It feels, uh, it feels good. And not only good in the sense of that you feel happy or satisfied, but it feels good in a sense of that you achieve something, kind of an accomplishment. So they, they, they call that eudaimonic well-being. You have hedonic well-being means like you're happy, you know, if you have good food or nice uh, feelings. But eudaimonic well-being refers to kind of a more general happiness. And uh, that's the reason why it also has what they call autotelic properties. It means actually it's more like a bit of addictive. One very important thing in, in flow is that there has to be some combination of the skills you have, your level of, um, well, um, your, your knowledge, your skills, and also how difficult or how challenging the task is. So if you have uh, high skills and the task is relatively easy, then it's not very likely that you will experience flow because you will feel either bored or at least you can do the task, but you might be kind of daydreaming or something. So very unlikely that you will um, experience flow. If the diff task is too difficult, then um, you will experience anxiety or, if you're, or maybe frustration. So there's a small bandwidth in which the, the the skills your skills and the the difficulty of the task is kind of match and in that bandwidth there the chances of um, getting into a flow are the highest and that's also related of course to being in control and it, because if you do a task that matches your skills then you feel that you can still do it and that gives you a sense of control and if you are in control you're not stressed you're relaxed and that helps you to get into a flow Okay, um, so these are characteristic, uh, characteristics of flow. And of course, the, f the, the, cop uh, the topic is already uh, known for quite some time. So maybe some decades and uh, a lot of research has been done on it. So we have uh, a lot of books that are written on flow. Uh, flow in, in relation to sports has been studied quite well. But flow in the brain, um, there are studies that have done that, but not so much. So therefore, it would be useful to really go into the, the brain and see if we can see the state also in different activity patterns in the brain. The brain is, is very complex, of course, has many, many different structures and different functions. So um, as flow is a very broad concept, it's sometimes nice to also explain it with broad uh, networks in the brain. Uh, so I will kind of focus on a few. We have the, the, the attentional networks, which are the salient network, the default mode network, and the a central executive network. So these are the three attentional networks. Uh, we have two more or less motivational networks, the uh, dopaminergic system, the, the reward system, and uh, the locus coelius. In terms of time and complexity, I will not go into the locus coelius. It's a bit of a, you know, it's, it's a bit of a complex thing. Yeah. So I will focus on the other ones, the three attentional networks and the reward system. So, but before I go into the flow, it's, I, I think it might be nice just to take a step back and to explain a little bit about these systems, because otherwise the story, you know, it it's, mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. So, um, yeah, so let's start with the attentional uh, networks. So we have three here, um, and the first one we start with is the central executive network, and that network is it plays a very strong role in uh, focused attention. So when you kind of uh, really reading a book and you really focused on, onto it, then um, these 
systems that are related to this large brain network, they are very active normally. Um, well, focus attention means that you have to kind of put your processing onto one of a specific topic, a book, a movie, a, a conversation, but it also, of course, means that you have to prevent distraction. So, um, for example, if I'm in a library, I'm reading a book, there might be a lot of people around me talking, like in, on a certain level, but I have to kind of block that out and, and focus on the book, of course. Um, so this network plays a large role in that, and also more generally in, in self-control. So in keeping your uh, posture, keeping your uh, how call it, decorum. So you see that if, if, if it gets damaged, then people, for example, start to swear more often or they lose inhibition or they do all kind of strange things. So it's related to focus, but also uh, self-control. Um, some of the areas involved in that, uh, the, part, the dorsolateral pr uh, prefrontal cortex, it's the areas in front of your brain, in the outer side, uh, it's, it's also uh, related to your working memory, where you keep the information active for, uh, for a while, and the posterior parietal cortex, right at the, at the end. It's also actually, this network is also involved in, in intelligence, problem solving, um, so it's, it's a executive control, intelligence network. Uh, okay, uh, we also had the default mode network, and what is interesting is this network uh, plays a large role in what they call self-reflection. So as soon as you start to think about yourself in, in situations in the past, in the future, then uh, this um, network is, is active. And it's also quite active if you're not engaging in any task. So um, if you're listening to me now, you probably have a lower activation of the default mode network because you have to focus and listen to what I'm saying. But if you kind of walk around or just sitting on your, lying on your bed or something and thinking about all what comes up, then uh, uh, this network is probably more active. So um, overall, the idea is that the network is for future scenarios. It's a simulation machine. So because we as humans, you know, we can look at the past, but we can also look at the future, see what, what might happen. And this is related to the default mode network. Yes. Okay. Um, then at the last, at last we had the salience uh, network, and this is a, a thing that um, as, as before we go there. First, two areas related to the default mode network: the medial uh, prefrontal cortex, it's the inner side of the um, frontal cortex, and the posterior cingulate cortex. Right. So now we have the salience network. Um, well, as it says. The, the function of this network is to respond to salient events or stimuli. So um, when I'm sitting in the, in the library reading, uh, I blocked all these noises and then suddenly somebody calls my name. So not in a very loud n n noise, but just in the same noise as the other uh, people speaking. But because I know it's my name, the salient network detects that and it kind of pulls me away from the book and maybe drives my attention to looking at who is calling my name. So this is uh, one example. So everything that is motivational relevant, that needs attention, um, is processed by the salient network. Yes? Uh, if, if some things are unclear, we might kind of ask some questions in between. Uh, 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 yeah? Small, there doesn't seem to be very much difference between the two hemispheres, is that? Of course, there are subtle differences. The brain is very complex. Yeah. But if you look at the, um, in general, this is kind of evenly distributed here. So now we have the salient network. Um, well, a different type of picture, but if you look at the yellow areas, these are the main structures, two other main structures of this network, the uh, anterior cingulate cortex. It's also involved in error processing when you make a mistake. And uh, the anterior insula, which actually plays a, a strong role in uh, your sense of self. Because uh, we, you know you see yourself as a person in, from different from the environment. Um, so your whole coherence as, as all your, your motivations, your, your body, your mind, your past, your future, kind of this is all collected into the anterior insula. And then we also, of course, have the, the motivational network, the reward system. So this is a dopaminergic uh, system, uh, which plays a very strong role in uh, intrinsic motivation. Uh, psychedelics uh, often work on this uh, system, like drugs. And it, it, um, it relates to the um, well, intrinsic motivation, the desire to get something. 
So it is called the reward system, but it's actually, so for example, if you like, you have an ice cream, um, you process, when you, once you eat the ice cream, there are other systems that, into, uh, that come into play, but the reward system notices that it's good, and next time it kind of lets you crave or lets you have the motivation to get the ice cream. So it's not the processing of the reward itself, but more the craving for it, the, the motivation to get it. Hmm. Um, but what are rewards? Rewards, can, of course, can be any, anything. Uh, we talked about money already, um, uh, recognition from other people, uh, accomplishment, um, but also very biological big things like good food, sex. Mm. These are all um, examples of things that are considered rewarding and, and so are motivational relevant. Um, so this is a very fundamental process. They also study that in, in, in science, for example, um, with animals, then they have a, a rat that's a little bit hungry, and then um, it goes in the, into a maze, so it can get one pellet of food or four pellets of food, but then they place an obstacle in, in the maze. Mm. And um, so if, if, the, if everything is normal, the hungry rat knows that, and he will go for the higher obstacle, mm. so he has to put some effort into it, because then he knows he gets uh, more food. Mm. But then they do something with the reward system, they kind of manipulate that. Mm. And then uh, what you see is that the animal tends to go for the easy, uh, the lower obstacle and lower food. So what, what, the, what, is, what is done is that um, it's no longer willing to put the effort into the task. Yeah, so there's always a, a balance between the cost and the effort. You can also uh, know that when tasks are rewarding, uh, but also tasks that challenge your skills, but are doable, those are the tasks that lead to flow. Um, there will be no flow or very small chance of a flow when the tasks are considered to be meaningless, they lack intrinsic uh, properties, or are way beyond your skill or way uh, below your skill. Yeah? So, um, based on the, the motivational properties, we can all already see what kind of tasks lead to flow or not lead to flow. I would think that if you engage in something, the flow will come. I, you know, it's a, it's a, what is, what is the Yeah, start? so when you engage... You, you understand what yeah, I mean? Yeah. yeah, so of course... Um, Sometimes it's, it seems meaningless, but when once you engage, you can get it going and you create meaning by entering the process. Yeah, yeah. so of course, um, sometimes the task, um, once you start, I mean, it might be, you might actually not be willing to do it or mm -hmm. you might not be very motivated to do mm -hmm. it. But then when you start, uh, you, you notice that you kind of get sucked up in the task yeah. Yeah. and then you will enter a flow anyhow. Yeah. And um, well, the idea is that this process is continuous. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's always, a, even at the micro level, you always make kind of a, a check yeah. between the, the, the effort and the, and the reward mm. or the cost and the rewards. And based on these calculations, you either continue to stay in a flow or to leave flow. Mm. So really it's, it's a constant moving between constant these two moving, states. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, yeah, once the, the decision is made, and of course it's a continuous process, then uh, there's an interaction with the three uh, systems, the three um, attentional systems. So. What happens is that the nice thing between uh, the systems, the executive network and the default met uh, mode network is that they are inversely related. So what you see is that most of the time, if the one is active, the other one becomes less active. So, and then the idea is that uh, if the reward system kind of signals that this is a, a rewarding task, then it's very likely that you will uh, focus. And it means that the central executive system becomes active um, helping you to focus, whereas the default mode network is it becomes uh, very low or inactive. And the inactivity of the default mode network probably is one of the reasons why flow is uh, characterized by having very low levels of self-reflection. You're forgetting everything around you and not thinking about other things beside the task. This is a very dynamic process, so you can have uh, parts, you know, even seconds or milliseconds in which they switch but uh, overall, if you have a very strong activation of the default mode network, you're probably daydreaming or thinking about other things than the task you were doing. 
So then you're out of the flow. So uh, this knowledge about uh, brain systems, uh, of course, it's nice for practice. It's also nice for science. You know how how do we understand um, uh, flow? So the question is, when uh, do you get in or out of flow dynamically? Um, well, of course, if there are distractions that are very salient, eh? so you can uh, in a flow you can kind of neglect most of the things. But even if the if the stimulus stimulus the event is very strong, has a very strong motivational relevance then it's very likely that you get distracted by it. At some point, you might also get fatigue or other things might be going on. So if you get distractions, then um, you're out of the flow. Uh, also errors. Um, in the beginning, when you make an error during a task, it might actually get you more in the flow because it says, oh, I have to try a little bit harder. You have to focus a little bit more. But when errors start to accumulate, then actually it's a signal that you're losing control, that the, the, the task might be beyond your skills. And then at some point you start to worry, you start, oh, maybe I can't do it. So this is, uh, in, in very short, the, the, the brain systems. I mean, of, of course, it's always more complex than that, but just the, the general outline is that these are the systems involved. Um, well, based on that, you can also ask, are there individual differences in flow? Eh? We already talked about that a little bit. Um, well, there are. Um, in many ways, but for example, uh, sensitivity for rewards. Some people have a very sensitive reward system, and it means that they tend to get sucked into things more easily. And if you do, well, then it helps you to get into flow. Although probably it's also nice when you have kind of a, a great attentional focus. So if you're able to focus your attention, because if you only have a sensitive reward system, without the focus, you become impulsive. You become distracted by everything you see and it's you know all, everything is nice and it goes from there to there and you're not uh, in a flow that easily but so if you have these two um traits it helps you to get in a flow uh, uh otherwise so sensitivity for punishment so uh the, the sensitivity of what might go wrong uh worrying a lot neuroticism actually prevents you from going into a, a flow and you can imagine why because if you worry if you think about if you activate your default mode net, uh, network all the time, then yeah, that's the kind of the opposite of uh, flow. So um, how is it with uh, flow and creativity? Well, if you look at creativity research, they often distinguish two types of uh, creativity. So um, they call going deep. You can go into a, a certain idea and, and work it out very deeply, very uh, detailed. And that uh, kind of is creative because it's a very you know, coherent picture of something. But of course, also going broad, making uh, associations that are, have not been made before. And uh, of course, ideally, you want to have both. So for example, Albert Einstein, uh, well, he, he came up with very new ideas, mm -hmm. ideas that were not uh, different from anything else. So he was kind of mm -hmm. have new associations, but he's always also able to kind of work it out. So once you had the idea, he kind of could translate that in, in formulas and then think about the implications of what of his ideas. And, and that was also, of course, a creative part. It's not only discovering new things, but also working it out mm. in terms of uh, what, it, what it means. So these are two types of creativity. And um, I think this is well known in the literature often on creativity. And of course, um, when you relate it to flow, well, what does it mean? It, it probably means that if you are in flow, most of the time you are busy working out a certain idea. I mean, you can get creative ideas. So for example, if you talk with people in a group and, and they're really in a flow of, of discussion and then in that situation, new ideas can pop up. Of course, that, that's possible. But I think most of the time being in a flow writing, for example, means that you kind of already had the idea and now you're trying to develop the, the, the idea. You kind of add details or work it out or something like that. Whereas the actual ideas, probably most of the real ideas you get when you're doing the dishes or you are in your bed or... So then this also implies that for creativity, you might have uh, an optimal mix of really getting into a flow, working out some ideas, working out what it means, and also default mode uh, uh, activity. Many things in psychology, it, it's good to talk about it on certain levels, but it, it always matures. It always uh, leads to a deeper insight when you also take into account 
the, the brain systems. So that's a good thing. And for example, I had here, I found this. It's a creative screenwriting. It's a site that gives uh, advice on how to um, uh, well, be a better screenwriter. And if you uh, have this information, you can also see where some of the things might come from. For example, here it says, well, reward yourself consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously. Take, no yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so take a good coffee, uh, make some appointments to buy yourself. And it's a psychological uh, kind of advice. But now we also know the, the background of this kind of uh, advice. Mm. So because it has to activate the reward system in order to get into That's a flow. So, and thank you. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dimitri. Wow. Okay. The now we need a reward. <gasps> <laughs> Not more best you kids. Need, no, yeah. no, I need, you need a reward. You need. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. So... Yeah. So, I, I, the, the question is not really part of the next discussion. Yeah. It's to, uh, because I know next to nothing about the brain physically, mm -hmm. except I've become recently obsessed with the left and right. right. That's why I was asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't seem, you know, I was looking at the diagram and said, well, these patches of color seem to be on, they yeah, so the, equally distributed in the diagram. Normally, it's, it's um, the distribution is equal. So you have these networks are all over the brain. Okay. But you see that left and right sometimes have different functions. Some people I think the right ones is, is yeah. um, like the positive emotions and the left and the negative is like, so these are all no tar or tar more targeted on the left and more Left is more analytical. Right. Yeah. Right, uh, right is more global, yeah. like, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But but, uh, but of course the brain itself is more like symmetric almost. Not not entirely, but no, no. The, the structures are always the same. Well, what we're doing, or the, you know, we're trying to, to relate what you've, you're telling us mm -hmm. to what we do mm -hmm. all the time and to yeah. try and find connections and so on. And I guess I guess the first thing is you talk a lot about um, goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the problem is how to relate that to what we do if we're writing a screenplay because it feels like you're writing a screenplay, you set out on a journey or a voyage, but you have no goal um, at all. Uh, and whereas if you're talking about an athlete, mm -hmm. for example, the, 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 I think an athlete has a very clear perception of there being a goal. So there's two things there really. One is it, the, the idea of having a goal to aim for doesn't feel like a, um, an accurate representation of what we're doing when we're writing, but you may tell us differently. Yeah. And the other thing is. Are those two things, are they the same, are they the same thing, the, an athlete being in the flow and a writer being in the flow? Okay. So, yeah. And so first regarding the goal, I think that it, the difference might be more in the time perspective. So of course, uh, an athlete might go, going to go for the finish and he has a goal of kind of being the first to finish. Mm -hmm. And so when you work on a screen on play, then it might be over a longer period, maybe years, maybe weeks. I don't know that's how long this process takes. But at the end, your goal, either consciously or unconsciously, is to write a, a nice piece. It's to write to write a, a movie or a book or a script or anything. So, and and so, it might be more long term. Mm -hmm. There might be more intermediate steps, but the, the there's still a goal. I still something you work towards. From my experience writing. Okay. Um, I'm not even sure my goal is to write a screenplay. I, I, I know this sounds crazy, but mm -hmm. I will sit down and I, my intention is I'm going to write a screenplay. But if this thing morphs or changes, I, I will be prepared to go with it and think, oh, you know what? This is not a screenplay for a film. This is, feels like a, a play for the radio. Or, ah, oh, this is not a piece of, this is something I would like to do without any words. Yes, Maybe it can be a collage. So I'm I'm, I'm, I'm changing. I, I'm, I'm, I feel very much in the flow because I'm immersed in it, yeah. but I'm, I'm allowing my objective to change all the time. And also I'm in some ways, I'm afraid of having a clear objective mm -hmm. because in some ways yeah. I, I've, I'm afraid that that will limit things too much for me and that possibility won't exist. Yeah. I would also say that maybe when I think I understand what you're looking for this meta level or meta goal yeah. but at the same time it's like uh 
sometimes you only have one goal, and that is to enter the flow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but but it, it's still that's true. But still, um, people, you know, you have only a limited number of of time, resources, and things to do. So, I mean, somewhere in the brain, the decision is made that you kind of it's useful for you to engage in this activity. So, I mean, you can also kind of go running or just have a nice drink or sure. you know f- visit friends. But at some point, your brain, whatever for whatever reason, decided, okay, now I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna write, create a script, or maybe it turns out to be an automobile or whatever. Yeah. So, but it, you, at, at least your brain has decided that this is an activity you want to engage in. Mm-hmm. So maybe you don't even know it, but your brain made some calculations regarding, okay, this probably if I do this, mm-hmm. it might help me. You know, if, if you look at a very fundamental level, it might help me survive, it might help me get status, it might help me get me ahead in my, my profession. So so basically, I think that what, if I understand this correctly, that what you or we are asking is, could there be more than one type of flow? Could you make subgroups in your research, Probably, based yeah. on your research? Probably, yeah. So conceptually but also in research Mm -hmm. so for example because there are some characteristics of flow that are general Mm -hmm. like the focus and and the Mm -hmm. for example you have the runners high i'm not sure if you're Mm -hmm. familiar with it Mm -hmm. the runners that are walking and they also often talk about flow Mm -hmm. but it might be a little bit of a different flow because this might be related to kind of endorphins that kind of get released in the body and that reduce the pain Mm -hmm. and at that point you know you don't you're running you don't feel pain anymore you're very yeah. so it it's might be different than for example when you work on a mathematical problem yes and even uh creative problems so for example we know that this default mode network is plays a very strong role in being creative yeah. so you can imagine that normally in flow the default mode network is is low the activity because you're not engaged in self reflection and in thinking about yourself but you still probably in in creative tasks you still need it to have these associations, to be kind of a daydreaming in between. Mm-hmm. So, for example, in in terms of conceptual, there might be different. But also in research, you might find that in some tasks, default mode network becomes even a bit more active than compared to other tasks. Mm-hmm. Or in some tasks, uh, there might actually also be mainly automatic behavior. So you don't see a very strong activation of the central net- network. But in other tasks, you might be kind of that there are. Very active, of course. Yeah, so, so I mean, the, a writer, Ian Sinclair, said all writing is done in a state of trance. So we, we were talking earlier about, oh, is trance, well, this is where we got. So I'm very, I'm very excited by the idea of trance. Mm-hmm. But the thing about trance, of course, is it doesn't appear to have a direction, i.e., is, is trance flow or not? I think so. In everyday language, trance, you know, it, it's kind of not that nicely defined. But I can imagine that people also use it for flow. Yes. But they also use it for a different state in which you kind of have free associations. Yeah. So for example, if you take some drugs or something, or I don't know, or you have kind of worried, well, you, have, you yeah. had a picture of someone meditating. Yeah, meditating. Yeah. So then you really, you know, you let your thoughts flow and then re- actually flow like in the sense of everything goes as it goes. And this might be trends, but it might not be the flow we are talking about here. Mm-hmm. Probably people also use it for when they are actually in a flow. So, for example, when you're writing and you're really involved, you get sucked up in 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 you know in writing and mm-hmm. you think about okay, what's the next sentence? How do I kind of what kind of details do I add? Mm. That's also some sort of trends, mm. but that's more related to the flow probably. So, have you studied on? <laughs> have you studied how long can one flow be? <laughs> or no, is I, it? I, I, or is it because because what we were talking about? Is this getting in and out of the flow and the and the default network playing a really important role for us and the the fact that maybe that maybe it's a transition between the flow and the and the trance yeah. that's uh, that's that constitutes our sense of creativity. Yeah. So probably what what's happening is is that. Um... So there's no, I think they didn't really actually test how long you can be in a flow mm-hmm. because it's also, it's it's like dynamic and subjective, right? So, mm-hmm. um, of course, you have real flow, but where it starts, where we say, okay, this, now we're really in the flow mm-hmm. where when you're kind of sub flow, you know, like almost in a flow. Mm-hmm. So there, it's not a clear, it's a, it's a threshold, how do you call it? Not a threshold. It's a, 
it's a di dimension. Yeah. yeah. So right. and um, yeah, and even if people are in flow, of course, on a micro level, you still still see yeah. shifts back to the default mode network. But overall, of course, you can have hours of of work. I mean, think about the teenager that that's engaged in in uh, computer games. They can go on for hours and hours, and then they only stop when they have they get, are hungry or very fatigued. Is the idea, yeah. And it also has to. Be, I mean, now we're talking. About, it's talking with very little uh, knowledge about meditation, but it's also about not um, uh, doing without reward. So you don't meditate and think, "Oh, if I meditate, I, I will get this." And no, also, no, that you don't. Work. You know, yeah. And also, you can't. You don't say that was a good meditation. No, you know, it's, it's, it's so and. Uh, the the result of all of this does lead to something does lead yeah. to a change because um yeah, well i think we talked about it is is what probably happens is that um in, in this case you kind of try to block all in ex external input you know because um you know you had this example where you had this uh, square yes. and if you get stuck to the square yes. you know you kind of um your your thinking will be limited you will yes. res restrict it yeah. so and then if you kind of lose conscious force if you f don't think about anything, yeah. then all the restrictions are kind of, they're gone, and then your associations become freer. Right, right. So, um, yeah, you get probably links that, that are not obvious if you kind of look at the table. Yeah. I still might, it might influence my ideas. Yeah. So it might steer me a certain direction. And if I kind of get rid of the table, get rid of everything around me, then, yeah, my association will be freer. We're just missing missing David Lynch now. We just need him. Yeah, no, I, I'm uh, I'm very much into it. So I can <laughs> <laughs> only by experience that kind of let you know. But, yeah, similar but uh, I wouldn't say that it's. Uh, I'm actually just sitting thinking whether what what part of the networks because it's it it's neither the active thing or the default. It's neither the blue or the it's. It is probably the default. It's, so the thing is, if you don't do anything, so if you don't have a, kind of a, a, a focus force, or you have no input at all, you're just lying there, uh, mm. just let let the things flow. Mm. Then that's probably the, default. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the default means that if you're not engaged in any focused or external processing. So so this. Uh Oh, we have so many things. We I think just maybe we should just pick on to this with the in and out of the flow. Yeah. Because because yeah. when we yeah, like I said that for uh, I can talk for myself. Yeah. It's like you are in a flow. You produce something, and then you leave it, and then I I believe many filmmakers are kind of up, obsessed with this uh, the default mode that kind of you. Don't do anything, and that's when it happens, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, so, and then you go back to the working process, yes. and there you want to have the flow. Flo, yeah, yeah. And I'm working with a, a, a director right now that he says, okay, we, when we touch upon a challenge and we're going to solve it, and if we didn't solve it within five ten minutes, we leave it. So that's kind of our flow became much better when he decided that yeah. he didn't want to continue. Yeah. So then we leave it, then we tell some dirty jokes, yeah. go have a coffee, then we come back, take up on, and th this problem that we're stuck with, we may return to it. Yeah, because uh, then uh, your because brain start, it keeps working on it. So that's yeah. the idea, and then yeah. Um, yeah, that, that even they do even research on that. So you have to kind of let people solve problems, mm -hmm. and then they get a period in which you have either distraction or you kind of have more time to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then this, they notice that in this distraction, condition people are better at solving the problem because you know you're kind of it's unconscious unconscious yeah. Yeah. Okay, so your 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 unconscious is working better than your conscious it's not better you need both because okay. first you need but to have processing of the information so my question yeah. to you is yeah. tell us how can we make a maximum out of this now it's still speculation but i have the idea that flow is mainly when you kind of try to work out the idea you already had so, for example, um, you know, when I work as a scientist, yeah. I have to uh, during the day I write, I, I talk to students, I, I even I read, but um, because it's work, and, and you can sometimes really kind of get in the flow of writing, yeah. but it's nevertheless it's work. Yeah. 
and and uh, you don't get new that new that many new ideas. Mm-hmm. Actually, if you have a lot of very busy periods mm-hmm. as a scientist, because my day is thinking of things, but and trying to work out things, mm-hmm. but you don't have the ideas during the day, mm-hmm. and then I do the dishes, or you know I'm gonna do something else, and then I start thinking about it, or it pops up, and then you have the idea, and then you said, well, maybe I'm I'm into something, and then again you kind of try to think about it. So how does it work? What does it mean? So you have to kind of go into the details. Mm. And then you can often go into flow. Mm. And then that needs effort, focus. You know, you have to kind of be conscientious. You have to put everything in the right spot. Yeah. And then often you see a flow. But it's not 100%. Eh? Because you can also, for example, if you have a group of people, have to come up with ideas. Then they can also get really into a flow to generate ideas. But this this is is really interesting. You mentioned that because we are, again this this is just gonna we're just gonna jump uh, yeah. with the connections. But we were talking earlier about uh, um, some exercises we've done here in this in the group West, where we had uh, say we have a group of participants. Each one has their own project mm-hmm. or an idea, but. Uh, we found ways of involving the whole group on that project, but where people ha- actually engage properly uh, in in someone else's idea. What but it it had huge. It worked incredibly well. Yeah. Um, so it was it was about concentration. It was about group. It was about responsibility. I think yeah. it was about um, a, I, a certain sense of love actually as well. Um, I think you know. It, it's always like if you work in groups, it is. Um... And you have to take care because it has positive sides. Eh? So, for example, you get new input, you get new f- views, new ways of looking at it, mm. and you can use that. But, um, for example, you also have these brainstorm sessions, yeah. and, and they were used quite a lot mm-hmm. because it was the idea that you have input from different mm. people. Then, uh, you know, you get broader, you get new, new ideas. But what you actually found is that uh, brainstorm sessions tend to restrict mm. thinking. You know, because um, if we're in a group and somebody calls something, then it's input for my thinking. So it restricts the, the direction I will go. Mm-hmm. So um, then probably if, if you work in a group, it might be better to have several people working on the problem individually. Yes. And then get them together and see what they yes, come up yes, with. Yes, yes. So, and that, so if you work on groups, that might be kind of a delicate thing. Yeah. You know, like yeah, you yeah. have to influence each other, yeah. but of course not too much yes. that you restrict yeah. what might be the idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, like we were talking yesterday about creation and feedback. Mm-hmm. That you, the, yeah. It's a constant thing between creating and getting feedback and can, like you said, I believe also, yeah. can be from your own body. Yeah. It's like, so So how does, uh, how, how does this relate to the flow? Is it? Yeah, so um, you have to have some sense of, of progress. Yeah, I think yeah. it's always, it was also mentioned. Yeah. You have to have the sense that you are on the right direction. If you have the feeling, you know, not making progress, mm. then at some point, you know, your brain starts to register, okay, this is not going well. Mm. And then maybe in the beginning, you can still kind of push it out. Mm. But there's a point where you say, oh, mm, well, mm. I'm not sure if this will, mm. it's useful to continue. Mm. So then, because it, it's still, the brain always makes this, con- this kind of uh, calculations of reward versus cost. Mm. And, and so you have to have some sense of, Reward progress mm. compared to the cost, and if if the if the, the the things that are the new things you develop, you know, are too little for the time you spend into it, the effort you put into it, mm. then at some point your brain says wrong. And, and just a really simple yeah. question: What is this cost, and why is it a, a problem? This cost and effort. So it, it's because you have to, as a human, as an organism, yeah. you have to decide where to put your time in. I mean, you only have limited time, you have limited resources, you have to sleep, you have to, you know, you have to, uh, so if you get food, for example, when you were mm. in the in the early ages, mm. so when, you know, so you have to decide, um, there's to be a mechanism to decide whether you do the interview or mm. go running or, mm. and I mean. What you just said reminded me about just the situation we are in now, that mm. will this be rewarding or not? Will this give, does it give meaning to continue with this question mm. and what is and what we are doing is actually by being curious yeah. and listening to each other mm-hmm. that's a, that's kind of kind of a relation activity yeah. that has to do with the relation between us 
that helps decide whether we should continue or not. And that's, I believe, why we are often talking about how can you create a room where you say yes, yes to an idea. Because if you say yes to an idea, mm -hmm. then the flow can continue. We can dig deeper into it. If we don't, it's like, no, it's not worth it. And the moment we you do. say no, yeah. you're out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so the prolonging of the flow has to do with creating a dialogue where you're curious and uh, yeah. general. And sometimes if you make a long, long list of questions, yeah. you hit a question which is very exciting because you intuit that the answers, which you're not going to go near, yeah. are waiting to, to be found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I think that's, that feels very close to writing. Yeah. You, you, because we also but talked it's a about general process. You also have the science, of course. It's the same, right? I mean, it's it's maybe different in, in some ways, but it's also creative. Yes, creative, uh, being creative, yeah. finding out how it works, and it's so no in art, at yeah. least in filmmaking. Yeah. there seems to be a conception of that uh, that art and creativity is the same, mm. and I believe that many, I mean, people seem to believe that creativity has to do with with the making of art. And yeah. uh, and that's kind of that should be the first thing we had discussed uh, when we started yesterday is the difference between because I think create, as I understand it I see it and find it stimulating to think about it creativity is an activity and the art may be the result but but a, yes. a, everybody is creative or can be creative all the time and producing all kind of things yeah but, so I mean like everything art is. It's creative, creativity, but it's also work. Yeah, yeah. So you have to kind of, you have to have ideas, but you have to kind of, some way you have to kind of get to the other people it's or... It, 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 I, I think we mentioned before, I love, you know, that thing where you've written something and someone else is reading it and they will tell you something you didn't see. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting because yeah. it means it's, it means it feels independently alive yeah. in some way. Yeah, so that, that's, again, it's, it's a delicate kind of balance between getting input mm. But also not being restricted by it because, mm. you know, if if it's if what you see is that most of the the big mm. like advancements are often made by still individuals that kind of have a very strange idea, which is kind of not connected to anything you know what was known. So and if you kind of let other people kind of influence that too much, mm. it might get drawn to the to the middle, you know, to the mm -hmm. yes. more average. Yes. Yes. That's also a and it's a danger. So it's a yeah. it's a positive thing, but also a danger. And we're always dealing with that because filmmaking is a collective effort. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so we have this uh, collaborative thing uh, going on, and at the same time, we want to make space for the individual contribution yeah. to to enhance the uh, the quality, the artistic quality of of of, yeah. uh, of the project. So, so we are all the time dealing with how can we do this, and I think that we have actually just to say from a diversity point of view have a, a long way to go because we feel that we are very open mm -hmm. to other inputs, but uh, actually uh, uh, diversity research shows that we are not mm. half as open as we claim to be <laughs> or yeah. like to see. It's, us also, it's also a difficult thing because everybody talks about creativity and about, you know, like having new things, mm -hmm. but it's always like when there's real, a new, really new thing, then most of the people, most of the time, don't like it, or they think it's weird, or it's yeah. so. And if that's not the case, then probably it's not particularly new. Mm. So, for, for example, even in the film world, if there's a kind of established film world, you can imagine that they're all very creative people. They can't get to be as creative as possible, mm. but they still work within the limits of what's you know yeah. of this group. Yeah. And then if somebody comes with a completely different idea. They might. The, the chances are quite big that they initially will re reject it. It, it, it. I think it's about cost again, isn't it? It's about the notions of what it's going to cost you. This yeah. embracing of an, of other, it can could come at great cost. Yeah, of course, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a great threat. Uh, I I worked with Michael Winterbottom once, and I yeah. I I was <laughs> Michael is is a wonderful filmmaker in so many ways. And one of the things that make him really interesting for me is that. If everyone's going this way, he will want to go that way for no reason other than that everyone's going this way. Yeah. And you, and every time it leads to something interesting, yeah, of course. Can I get back, get back yeah. to this? With the, I'm obsessed with this, uh, the balance between skills and challenges. Mm -hmm. That the flow 
if the task is too difficult yeah. or the task task is too easy, yeah. then you don't get into the flow situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I believe that what you are doing as researchers yeah. all the time is finding structures and methodologies to approach problems and make them use spending, I don't know how many years, yeah. just studying a very, very small detail on something. Mm-hmm. And we think it's so crazy in a way. Mm-hmm. And and at the same time, what you did was you were taking all other parts away in order to make the task uh, manageable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually, I feel that a lot of our artistic or creative problems when we make film mm. comes from this not being able to solve one thing at the time or de- or deal with one thing at the time do you have any thoughts on this and the because it must be a question of how how you structure your challenges to yes. to if you want to enter the flow as much as possible so i think that that's of course the task can be very different you can have a structured task or a very task in which you kind of have no bo- boundaries yeah. but even then you still have probably some sense of progress or lack of progress C- can you talk about how rhythm might build into that because i'm aware that <clears throat> if we buy into this idea of flow yeah. um that sometimes when you get stuck or you realize oh i'm down here in in the progress mm-hmm. and something's wrong you you know that the problem is earlier. So very often, if you've lost the feeling or the flow, Mm -hmm. you return to the top and you'll try to re, you'll try to start again in a way. And I, I feel that maybe you're look, you're looking for a kind of rhythm. I think very often the rhythm is, uh, swift and you want it to be swift because that tells you that it's flowing. Mm. And also, you're trying to get to the end, mm. even you don't, even though you don't know what the end is yet. Yeah. You have a sense that it will end, um, but it seems to me to do with a sense, some sort of rhythm or momentum or something. Yeah, yeah you can, see, of course, when you solve a problem or do something creative. I mean, there are processes. You can, you can be in a process somewhere, and sometimes you have to go back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. But if you do so. You still have the idea that it's worth your while, so you're still, you know, you're still working on the the, the topic. Yeah. So, for example, if I give you a, a, an equation or something, you have mm. to solve, mm. and maybe in the beginning you have no idea what to do. Mm. So you just look at it, and nothing comes to mind. But you still kind of you try to kind of reshuffle a little bit, maybe, or mm. and then you still might have in the beginning you still have, have a sense that you might be onto something. You don't have to progress now. Mm. But you feel that you're still, you know, you're on, and at some point, if that doesn't occur, if you say, well, I'm shuffling all the time mm. and there's no whatever progress can be, there's no sense of progress, mm. then you, at some point you say, well, consciously or unconsciously, you say, well, this is not worth my while. This is, I, I'm going to stop sure. this behavior. Sure. Because if, if I write, mm. you know, it, it's also quite difficult to write. It's, it, it might be a creative process. And sometimes you have a day, I spend a whole day, and then at the end, I have three lines. Yeah. It really is crazy mm. and it's really frustrating. Mm. And then I'm really sad because you know you lost all this time without very low productivity. But at least, and then some the next day, or maybe the day after that, you work on it, and then it goes like, Bridge. you know, you kind of write a long, long story, and it's it fits all together. Mm. And then I say, well, did I was the day lost? No, it was not lost because all, the whole time I was thinking about it, processing it, yeah. and well, then I stopped. And then it continued in my head, probably. Mm. And so when I, uh, because because it wasn't finished, mm. you know, it, your brain starts to work on it. And then when you s- start again, yeah, then all the information you kind of did when you kind of, of the work you did on the day, but also after that, yeah, it, it helps you to, to make progress. Sure. Yeah. So this about music reminded me of mm. some really weird thing, I think, from film editing. Some editors love to have music mm. Yeah. Which I find completely, I don't understand. It's like a mystery to me. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. But 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 it's obvious when you see them that for some of them, this cre- helps them create the flow. Yeah. Probably uh, what 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 happens is that they do a task that they are quite well versed in, so they they're very skilled, 
And so, um, no. I mean, it, uh, yeah. so, oh, I mean it, it takes a lot of attention. So it needs you know, arousal. You need to be awake. You need to, but it doesn't need the real like hard cognitive yes. processing. Yes. I, yes. I mean, it, it does. Yes, it, it does. Yeah, this is a focus. But it's still, they can apply their more or less automatic behavior. Mm. Probably so that you know they, you have the sense of it's the work continuously for maybe I don't get this uh, I couldn't <laughs> to, I do, the idea of writing with music I mean I, I I just don't understand but I know plenty of writers who do mm. as, and especially in cafes and so on yeah. and and they plug into music and then write and it, I think it, I think somehow the noise is white noise and making that cave it also depends on your so you have individual differences it depends on for example being in, introvert extrovert mm. so. The brain, you know, it has, it has some level of being awake. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea is that for people that are um, like introverts mm -hmm. or more like, you know, like choir people, mm -hmm. their brains actually are very awake. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of have a lot of input from the other, you know, from outside, mm -hmm. then you get overstimulated. And then so uh, you can't write. So if you have a lot of, if, you, if I play music mm -hmm. and I write, it kind of, I would be, you know, yeah. but um, so we're some people. Introverts? Just maybe yeah, so. We had two editing <laughs> yeah. rules, you know, yeah. and then it was two of the best editors in Denmark, and and it's true that it was the extrovert editor and yeah. his extrovert assistant. They were playing loud music, yeah. and next to them so, was I was yeah. assistant of the other very introvert, and he was just he was just getting Going nuts, crazy. you know, by the yeah. loud yeah. music yeah. from yeah. the other so because room. Because the idea so. is that extroverts they're busy, they're quite you know even I'm like mm. very busy, but um, but the idea is that you're busy because your brain. Is more or less more asleep, mm. so uh, you try to activate the brain by being busy, ah. and then um, if you have music, mm. it kind of it makes you awake, mm. so it puts your brain in an optimal state for this behavior. Mm -hmm. And whereas other people, they already are in an optimal state, and if you kind of add noise, ah. it brings them over this optimum. Ah, that's very interesting. Uh, I, just on music, mm -hmm. while we're chasing the music thing, it, um, the the only time I've used music uh, in when writing is if. Again, it's about not feeling that it's it's. I'm not feeling I'm in it enough, it's not, and therefore I will play one particular piece of music, and I'll play it over and over again, yeah. and what it to give me an emotional emotion yeah, yeah. state, and then I turn it off, and then I can write, and it's, I yeah. use it like a drug, really. Yeah, yeah. That that's also uh, that's actually a part of being emotional intelligence. It's the idea that you are able to kind of induce certain emotions. Yeah. To help you with uh, with certain tasks, because sometimes you need emo you need anger, mm. sometimes you need sadness, sometimes you need happiness. So, and that you know a little bit about, maybe even consciously or unconsciously again, to know what state do I have to induce in order to do this task mm -hmm. in the best way. So, and then music, of course, helps because music brings you in a certain state. What we're looking at, I believe, is that being professionals, one dealing professionally with our task of developing projects as screenwriters. Mm. Uh, we look, look, what are our methods? Can we improve them? Mm -hmm. Can we use knowledge to, Im to improve what we found more or less intuitively? Is there any ways we can improve the, the situations where we're in a flow or prolong it or make uh, use of this? We talk a lot about in and out of, of flow also working on different projects in order to all the time be in flow. Um, I, I think, that, well, that, that's where science and, of course, creative arts or creative activities kind of merge because if you want to do that, you have to have some, you know, like structured way of kind of seeing what works, what doesn't work. So, um, you know, you have to think about, okay, so now we're going to incorporate this in our training or in a workshop. Mm. And, yeah, in some way you want to see whether it actually works. And then people can have a feeling that it works, mm. which might you might say, okay, this is already enough for us. Mm. Mm. But sometimes you also want to know if it actually works, and how do you know? So you can know you know by studying it or by so, for example, like the the, the uh, group uh, how I call it when you are together and and try to uh, come up with ideas. Yeah, yeah the writers' the, room. Or... Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. So most of the time, people feel that they were very creative, right? So uh, the, the the subjective feeling. It was this really nice, and we worked, and we came up with very new ideas. Mm -hmm. But then, when you look at it more objectively, or mm -hmm. as far as possible, and you look at let other people judge the ideas mm -hmm. in different conditions, mm -hmm. 
without no knowledge of what mm. went on, mm. then what you find is that you get the best ideas when you kind of take the other approach. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you need mm. a systematic approach or making thin slicing or mm. a structured way of, of testing whether something worked or not. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah.